Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are going over key ACLS medications. These are going to be the medications that we are going to cover today. And if you want to continue learning to master the essentials of the ER, such as vasopressors, emergency conditions, and obtaining a rapid history and physical and much more, consider checking out our book on Amazon. The link is in a pinned comment. Now, let's start off with epinephrine. It's going to be used during cardiac arrest. It can be used in post-cardiac arrest to maintain perfusion and in symptomatic bradycardia. We know that epinephrine is an alpha, beta-1, and beta-2 agonist. So it increases the heart rate, the strength of contraction, increases blood pressure, and helps open up the airway. For these reasons, we administer epinephrine in cardiac arrest to help improve coronary and cerebral perfusion, giving the patient the best chance for a successful resuscitation. The dose during cardiac arrest for adults is 1 mg every 3 to 5 minutes via IV or IO. Epinephrine can also be used during post-cardiac arrest to maintain perfusion, a MAP above 65, as maintaining perfusion is key to avoid further damage to vital organs. Although infusion rates vary from facility to facility, a common infusion range is 0.1 to 1 microgram per kilogram per minute with a max infusion rate of 2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Please, however, follow your own facility's protocols for start rates, titrations, and max doses. A key point is that there are other vasopressors, and a different vasopressor, such as norepinephrine, may be chosen by the provider for pressure support after cardiac arrest instead of epinephrine. So just be mindful of it. It doesn't always have to be epinephrine. There's other pressors. And epinephrine can also be used for symptomatic bradycardia. And an epinephrine infusion may be administered while more permanent treatments are prepared, like an intravenous pacer. Per ACLS, the infusion dosing range in symptomatic bradycardia is going to be 2 to 10 micrograms per minute. Now, let's talk about amiodarone. It's going to be used in cardiac arrest with ventricular fibrillation or with pulses ventricular tachycardia. It's in an it's in antiarrhythmic that prolongs the action potential and refractory period of cardiac cells. We hope that this essentially calms cardiac cells down, making them less excitable, less prone to ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. The dose in cardiac arrest with V-fib and pulses VTAC is 300 milligrams IV or IO, and if a second dose is needed, it is 150 milligrams. If ROSC is a chief after the administration during the code and infusion should be started to maintain stable cardiac cells. Another use for it is going to be ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. The dose will be 150 milligrams over 10 minutes, followed by one milligram for one minute every minute over six hours, which comes out to typically 360 milligrams. And then this is followed after the six hours by an effusion of 0.5 milligrams per minute over 18 hours. Now, keep in mind that when administering the infusion in the acute setting, carefully monitor for its side effects, including bradycardia, hypotension, and QT prolongation, especially in that post ROS. Monitor for hypotension. I've had that happen to uh, my patients in the past. Now, let's get to atropine. Atropine is used in symptomatic bradycardia as it blocks parasympathetic stimulation of the heart. It blocks the vagus nerve, and as a result, it helps increase the heart rate. The dose is one milligram every three to five minutes up to a max of three milligrams. The key thing with atropine it is, is that, it, it, that it will most likely not be effective in third degree blocks. It may still be ordered by your provider, but it should not delay other more effective treatments like pacing. Another key with atropine is that you should be cautious when using it in ACS patient as the increase in heart rate will place further demand on the heart, therefore in further worsening the ischemia going on. Now let's discuss sodium bicarb. It's given to help treat the associated metabolic acidosis from prolonged cardiac arrest as a result of the hypoxia and poor perfusion that starts to happen. It's also used when hyperkalemia is suspected and with certain overdoses such as tricyclic antidepressants. Although bicarb is very useful, your initial attention in cardiac arrest should be focused on high-quality CPR, oxygenating the patient, epinephrine, delivering defibrillation as indicated. Then, when, ad uh, when addressing the H's and T's, 
then is sodium bicarb considered an administer? Now, the typical dose for the sodium bicarb during cardiac arrest in a dose is going to be one full amp or, in other words, 50 MEQ and 50 mLs. Next is going to be lidocaine. It's another antiarrhythmic. It's also going to be used for ventricular fibrillation and pulses ventricular tachycardia. It blocks sodium channels in cardiac cells, which helps slow down conduction and ultimately stabilize cardiac cell membranes. The adult dose is 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV. And if a repeat dose is needed, it's going to be between 0.5 to 0.75 milligrams per kilogram. It can also be used in ventricular tachycardia with the pulse as an infusion, as like we did with amiodarone. But lidocaine has its own dosing for that. Now, magnesium is also used in cardiac arrest with polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, or in other words, torsades. Magnesium is essential in regulating cell membrane ion channels. Therefore, by replenishing, we help stabilize cardiac cells. The dose is 2 grams IV. If magnesium assisted in achieving ROSC, an infusion of magnesium may be ordered by the provider. And if so, monitor magnesium levels closely and monitor for the side effects of hypotension and bradycardia. And although magnesium, magnesium is important, keep in mind that torsades should be defibrillated as well. Now, calcium chloride is given when hyperkalemia or calcium, chocolate, uh, calcium channel blocker overdose is expected. It's also thought to help the heart contract a little better. Now, Generally, it's given when the H's and T's are addressed during the cardiac arrest, but many providers do routinely administer calcium chloride early on in the arrest as well. The dose is going to be one gram. And now, please know the difference between calcium chloride and calcium gluconate. Calcium chloride is very concentrated in comparison to to calcium gluconate and it's only going to be used during cardiac arrest calcium gluconate is on the other hand is less concentrated and it's used for most patients now with hypoglycemia and dextrose so we know the hypoglycemia is a reversible cause of cardiac arrest and a point of care glucose level is commonly checked early on in the arrest if the glucose level is low an amp of dextrose is given iv an amp typically has 25 grams in, 50, in, in a 50 ml syringe. Ensure to recheck the glucose level after, administration, after the administration of dextrose to verify that it actually worked, as well as rechecking it to make sure that you're training the level so that it is not dropping. And if it is, you catch it and you can give additional dextrose amps or start the patient on an infusion of a D5 or a D10 drip. Now, adenosine is used for SVT as it interrupts the rhythm by blocking conduction through the AV node, allowing the heart to go back to normal sinus rhythm. When giving adenosine, it is essential that the patient also be connected onto the defibrillator and that the crash cart be at bedside to ensure you are prepared for anything that may, that may come up. The dose of adenosine should be uh the the dose of adenosine should be given in a large bore IV, ideally in the AC immediately followed by lifting the arm and giving a rapid flush of 20 ml of normal saline so that it reaches the heart as adenosine has a short half-life of 10 seconds. The initial dose is 6 mg and if a repeat dose is needed, it is 12 mg. Some providers may choose to start with a 12 mg dose initially. Now, let's get into some nursing tips. The main tip is that you need to memorize these medications in the treatment typically perform with ACLS. There are countless things, I understand that, there are countless things that you need to know as a new ER nurse, but ACLS, including the medications, the treatments, how to defibrillate, cardiovert, pace, and everything associated with, with ACLS is extremely important. When an emergency comes up, you want to, you want to be sure that you understand the treatments and you want to make sure that you understand the treatments, right? Um, you have to either quiz yourself, you need to ask your preceptor to quiz yourself, or you get together with the other new ER nurses in your cohort and review with each other. But you must memorize and understand the ACLS protocols as an ER nurse. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.